Let's join in singing our opening hymn, Fire of Commitment. As Joe Wright lights our chalice, let us say together our covenant. Enriched by our differences and joined together in our search for meaning, we covenant with ourselves and each other to seek truth in a spirit of love, to strive for justice, and to serve others with a joyful heart. Please be seated. We're going to try an experiment for the month of February in which we invite you for the next couple minutes to turn and greet the person you're sitting next to uh, or behind or in front of and say hello. Uh, in the Christian church, uh, it's called passing the peace. And so you turn and say to someone, may peace be with you. But you can say whatever you want.
If you're viewing the service on Zoom, please remember you can activate closed captioning if you think that's helpful to you. And if you'd like to talk with others after the service, there will be a virtual coffee hour. Just stay logged in and you'll be invited into a breakout room. If you're attending in person, just join us for coffee hour after the service. Now, please remain seated and join in singing our centering song. <clears throat> This is the Sunday where we start the process of inviting you to make your financial commitment for next fiscal year, which doesn't start till July. Uh, but we want to get this organized now so that we can plan our budget for the spring, during the spring. And we have a testimonial of commitment from one of our members, Neil Goldstein. Neil, where are you? There he is. <laughs> Thank you, Neil. Good morning. Good morning. I've been a member here for about 30 years, and like many of you, I have stayed mainly for the free coffee. Uh. Oops, sorry, I meant to cut that part, and apologies to the people on Zoom. Um, but seriously, what first drew me and my wife, Jean Wallace, to this congregation were the Unitarian Universalist ideals. We were the kind of people you've probably heard about who were UU but didn't know it until we encountered the purposes and principles. Also, part of the initial attraction was the religious education program, which helped us raise our daughter, Veronica, who is now 33 years old and is objectively speaking, a credit to UUCDC. <laughs> I've stayed because this place is special to me. Uh, some of us say we came because of the ideals, but stayed because of the people. In the last few years, I've been gratified by how, over time, pardon me, over time, we made an unusual double challenge while still dealing with the disruptions of COVID, we had to cope with the departure of the Reverend Peter Friedrichs, our much loved minister for 15 years. For many of us, he was, our, he was the only Unitarian Universalist minister they'd ever known. It was little wonder that the double challenge threw some of us for, for a loop for a while. But a fair number of us have remained here as the congregation has evolved through several settled ministers, several interim ministers, and of course, lay leaders. It has become clear to me that however committed, skilled, and even charismatic our ministers may be, they are not the church. We, you and I, are the church. There's no autopilot here. What we choose to do or not to do determines what this church is. 
Through the years, I've been inspired by seeing you nurture this congregation while increasingly bringing UU values to the wider world, which needs those values now more than ever. And I thank you for that. But enough about you. My life has been enriched by involvement here uh, through several activities including serving as board president at the time we built this beautiful sanctuary. Uh, I've uh, been a member of a ministerial search committee. I've done social justice work and participated in small gatherings, now known as Soul Matters groups, in a rewarding program that I highly recommend. This place is special to me because it's the only place where I feel truly safe to work on myself and on that wider world. Here I feel I'll be supported when I express my feelings and opinions. I savor that feeling of trust. We here are part of one liberal religious community, but of course we're not all the same, either theistically or culturally or politically or in several other important ways. Nevertheless, here we are, having promised to support one another on our searches for our own personal truths. That's a radically wonderful thing. How lucky we are to be able to do that. All this for the bargain price of a yearly pledge donation to the fund drive. I hope you agree that's a pretty sweet deal. In fact, my pledge form is going into the box in the lobby this morning. Thanks for listening. But Joe, could you come up? I have a question. Well, first we're going to sing Spirit of Life, and then I'll ask you the question. Let's join in Spirit of Life. Where's Chrissy? Uh, <laughs> Chrissy is on the blue route. She has a flat tire. <laughs> so pretend that Joe is Chrissy. Yeah. <laughs> well, Joe, we're, <clears throat> we're talking about uh, church finances a little bit this morning. If someone gave the church a million dollars, what would be the first thing you would buy with the money? A million dollars? Well, first thing I do is I write a thank you note. <laughs> I, I'd, be, I, I'd be thankful that it wasn't a matching contribution, right? <laughs> so, so and then I would, and then I would thank them for air conditioning during the summer and better heating in the winter, huh? How about that? <laughs> Well, meanwhile, we're going to have the offering. Do you want to announce that? Of course. Thank you, Roger. And we'll do our best this morning with Chrissy not here. During our uh, offertory music this morning, you can text your donation to the number provided on the screen. And also there are boxes in the back of the sanctuary where folks can leave checks and cash. Thank you.
Thank you, Joy. Now, Chrissy was prepared to read this story this morning, which I'll read. <laughs> Many years ago, in the land of Transylvania, there was a village. Many of the people in the village were Unitarians, but they did not have a church building to gather in. So they decided they would work together long and hard to build themselves a church. The stonemasons hammered sharp chisels to cut great blocks of gray stone, then the stones into stout and sturdy walls. The glazers made tiny glass panes and fitted them neatly into the windows with leaded lines. The carpenters carved wood for the pair of wide opening doors, setting them on strong pegs so that the doors hung straight and square. The bell was brought from a faraway city, then hoisted by ropes with a heave and a hoe to the top of the lower. The weavers uh, wove fine cloths on the altar table, cloths embro embroidered with flowers and edged with lace. The smiths hammered black iron into the tall lampstands and hammered thin bronze into shining oil lamps. Finally, when the building of the church was done, the painting of the church would begin. The painters mixed bright colors, royal red and shimmering gold and brilliant blue, and everyone in the village, old and young, women and men, boys and girls, came to decorate the church. They painted flowers, they painted trees, they painted designs around the windows, different designs around the doors. And all, and at the end of the day, when it was finished, when their church was finally done, all the people of the village stood back to admire it. We will eat now, announced the elder of the village, because everyone was hungry after their long day's work. And later tonight, we will come back to pray. So the people of the village went down the hillside to their homes and their suppers, all except one little girl named Zora and her father who stayed behind. They had brought their own bread and cheese. They ate their food slowly, sitting on the grass on the hillside and admiring the new church with the st strong stone walls, its tower and its magnificent bell. After they had eaten, they went back inside, opening those carved doors to go into the gloriously painted sanctuary inside. Oh, look, Father, Zora cried, running from the picture to picture with her footsteps echoing in the stone walls. See how pretty the church is. She stopped in the center of the church, twirled, slowly twirled, twirled around and said, see how grand? Yes, it is, said her father, looking around and nodding with pride. Yes, it is. But father, she said suddenly, we have not finished. What do you mean? There are tall iron lamps uh, stands all along the walls, but there are no lamps. The church will be dark when people come back. Ah, no, little one, said her father. The light of the church comes from its people. You shall see. He rang the bell to call the people to worship. Then they took uh, his daughter by the hand and led her back outside. They waited on the grassy hillside next to their beautiful church of strong gray stone. The sun had set behind the mountains and night was coming on. Yet in the growing darkness, tiny points of light came from many directions and moved steadily up the hill. Each family is entrusted with a lamp, little one, her father explained. Each family lights its own way here. Where's our family lamp? Your mother's carrying it. She will be here soon. The many lights move closer together, gathering into one moving stream, all headed the same way, growing larger and brighter all the time. Zora, Zora, uh, Zora's mother arrived, bearing a burning oil lamp in her hands. The father lifted Zora so she could set their family's lamp high in its tall iron stand. All around the church, other families were doing the same. Soon the church was ablaze with light in every corner, for all the people of the village had gathered to pray and sing. All through the worship service, Zora watched the lights flickering glow. She watched her family's lamp most of all. 
When the service was over, her father lifted her high. She took the shining bronze lamp from the lampstand. Its curved sides were warm and smooth in her hands. Her mother carried the lamp home with the uh, flame lighting the way. The lamp flame lit their house when they returned home. Zora washed her face and got ready for bed by the light of the flame. Mother, Zora began as she climbed into bed and lay down. Yes, little one, her mother asked, tucking her wool blanket around Zora's shoulders. Father said the light of the church comes from its people. Yes, but also the people take their light from the church. Over on the table by the fireplace, the shiny bronze lamp was still burning, and we have that light every day. Yes, indeed, said her mother, and even when we are not in church, even when the lamp is not lit, we carry the light of truth in our minds and the flame of love in our hearts to show us the right way to be. The light, the light from the truth and love will never go out. Years passed, Zora grew, the bronze lamp came into her care. She kept it polished and clean. And when the bell rang out across the valley to call the people to worship, she carried the lamp back and forth to the church on the hillside, the flame always lighting her way. When the time came, she made more lamps and gave them to her children, who made more lamps and gave them to their children. And so it went on through the years even until today. Now, today is a special day at UUCDC. Today, we talk about where we've been, all we've been through together, and we celebrate our bond as a community. And we think about the future, where we want to go, and what resources we need to get there. In your order of service, you'll find a light bulb. This is your light, the light you bring to UUCDC each Sunday. I want you to think specifically about what you bring to our congregation. What do you, do you bring love, caring, enthusiasm, curiosity, or questioning? Do you bring your time volunteering? Do you bring financial support? Now after the service, after the service, I encourage you to visit the fun drive table out in Fellowship Hall. There will be markers for you to write your ball. Tell us what light you bring to UUCDC. Thank you for listening to our story this morning. Okay, and now we'll have our uh, sending song. And I think first we, uh, we go through it once and then the teachers leave, and then the children leave. Now, the Reverend A. Pal Davies was one of the most brilliant Unitarian Universalist preachers of the last century, and he, he preached at All Souls Unitarian Church, a beautiful, beautiful church on 16th Street in Washington, D.C., and having grown up there, I can always remember driving past it and what, what a beautiful place it was, and as I became older, I had the opportunity to go to services there, and, and they were just wonderful. 
Here are the words of the Reverend Davies. Let me tell you why I come to church. I come to church and would, whether I was a pe preacher or not, because I fall below my own standards and need to be constantly brought back to them. I'm afraid of becoming selfish and indulgent. And my church, my church of the free spirit, brings me back to what I want to be. I could easily despair. Doubt and dismay could overwhelm me. My church renews my courage and my hope. It is not enough that I should think about the world, its problems, at the level of a newspaper, article, or magazine discussion. It could soon become too low level. I must have my conscience sharpened, my conscience sharpened until it goads me to the most thorough and responsible thinking of which I am capable. I must feel again the love I owe others. I must not only hear about it, but feel it. In church, I do feel it. I'm brought to, toward my best in every way toward my best. It may not be so for everybody, but for me, this alone would make me seek a church. If I stayed away too long, I would be afraid of slipping into self-centeredness and low ambitions and careless thinking. The sharpness of my moral perceptions might be blunted and nothing would sharpen them again. I need to be reminded that there are things I must do in the world, unselfish things, things undertaken at the level of idealism. Workaday enthusiasms are not enough. They wear out too soon. I want to experience human nature at its best and be reminded of its highest possibilities. And this happens to me in church.
Thank you. Once at a memorial service, I heard a son begin his eulogy about his father by saying, Dad died because he did not want to clean out the basement. <laughs> and we all laughed. But I thought of all the stuff that had accumulated in my basement, and I thought, I don't want my children to make that joke at my memorial service. <laughs> so, at the beginning of the pandemic, I worked on cleaning out my basement. These days, thanks to months of isolation, my basement back in Maryland is cleaned out of most stuff. Now, I know I'm not alone in this because back when I was cleaning my basement out and driving to Goodwill, there would be a line of cars waiting to unload. But still, there are some things I didn't get rid of. I have a two-volume biography of the early life of Abraham Lincoln autographed by the author, Carl Sandburg published in 1926. It's worth about $100. I keep it in a special location in a bookcase. I'm comforted by the fact that I own the two volumes, and I feel a connection to the poet, who I know held that book in his hand when he signed his autograph. Now, I've not actually read the book, I don't want to wear it out. I have a few other possessions that I keep, but they are so fragile that I don't actually use them. Somewhere we have two cups that my partner Leslie and I bought on our honeymoon in England in the summer of 1981. That was the year of the royal wedding. The cups mark the wedding of Charles and Diana. We put them away for safekeeping, and we've never used them. Perhaps you have had the same experience. Perhaps you have possessions that you value, but they feel so fragile that you dare not use them. My colleague, the Reverend Dr. Patrick O'Neill, tells a story about this. About 40 years ago, he was serving his first little congregation out in the Yakima Valley of Washington State. And one day he got a call from a local farming family telling him that their mother had died and asking if he would come to do the burial service. They were not church people themselves, but their next door neighbor had once attended a Unitarian Universalist church, and he recommended that the family call Patrick. The woman who died was an elderly woman, many years a widow. She and her husband were among the early farming families in the area, and in fact, they had become quite wealthy over the years. The land that she and her husband had bought cheaply in the 1920s, on which they had barely survived starvation through the Great Depression, turned into something of a gold mine in the 1940s when they irrigated it and discovered that apple trees fared exceptionally well in that volcanic soil. Within 20 years or so after World War II, Washington State apples were world-renowned, and the Yakima Valley was at the center of a worldwide agricultural business. This woman and her husband, who lived quite modestly, managed to leave their children a sizable fortune. 
When Patrick arrived at the house that evening to meet with the family and plan the funeral service, the woman's growing daughter was sitting in the living room with several cartons and crates opened in front of her. And she was crying. I just found these in the closet, she said. They are two full sets of Wedgwood china from England that my mother apparently ordered from a catalog 30 years ago and then stored them in the closet. They've never been used, not even once. They had never even been taken out of the boxes that they came in, even to be looked at. I find this so sad, she said. My mother was so afraid that she might chip or break even a single plate that she never once dared to take them out of the carton. That's how she was. That's so typical of our mom. None of us will ever know the deceased woman. Still, we can wonder, wonder about those beautiful unused dishes. The daughter saw them as symbolic of her mother's typical overcautious approach to life. And perhaps she was right. But what is the real story? We may think we know our parents well, but our parents are hidden from us by desires and dreams that we do not know. As he told the story, Patrick speculated about this. Was the old woman so fearful of damaging these beautiful things that she would not even put them out where she could enjoy looking at them? That really would be sad if it were true. Or did the dishes perhaps represent something else for the old woman? For this farm woman who had survived the hardships of the hardest years, when she and her family had endured near destitute poverty in the Great Depression of the 30s, were these exquisite dishes perchance some secret insurance against the return of hard times? Her personal barter, perhaps, against the years of drought and failed crops that she had known years before and wanted never again to revisit. Or could it be that these elegant place settings were a forgotten hope chest? Perhaps ironically met for the very daughter who now judged her and wept at what she assumed was her mother's choice of caution over enjoyment in life. Or were they something else, these treasured dishes and fragile cups? The one impulsive gesture of extravagance. Perhaps stored away in a closet by a country woman whose life was otherwise a model of moderation and restraint. We'll, we'll never know, of course, writes Patrick, and neither will her daughter ever know for sure, but whatever story really accounts for the beautiful unused dishes don't you just wish that in all those years the old woman had found it within herself at least once, at least once, to splurge a little? Oh, some afternoon when perhaps no one else was around, maybe, or better yet, maybe when an old friend was visiting or perhaps with her daughter. Don't you wish she had just 
served herself a, at least one incredible, elegant cup of tea, perhaps a wonderful little dessert on that exquisite china ware. Wouldn't you hope that she would have dared it one day, risking it all, throwing caution to the wind, and just for the sheer living of it, allowed herself once to make bold use of the beauty and craft of those treasured dishes, those fine, fragile cups. It's a wish for us all. It's a wish for all those moments in our lives when we too are afraid of using the best that is in us, the good stuff, the stuff that we keep locked away inside us, like chinaware in a closet. Think of those moments in our lives when for fear of being a breakage, for fear of failure, for fear of rejection, for fear of being hurt or laughed at, we too choose safety, safety over adventure. Sometimes I just want to stay in that newly renovated basement and not come out. <laughs> Moments when we choose retreat instead of choosing the challenge of growth and new learning. Now, I don't know about you, but I was raised in a German-American family that practiced restraint. Love and affection were more implied than said. Hugging only occurred rarely, and my parents did not use the silverware that was kept in a box in the storage room. In Kentucky, my aunt and my uncle on my father's side of the family, they kept brand, a brand new set of tires in their garage. Perhaps Chrissy should have had this today. Brand new set of tires in their garage because they could remember a time, a time back during the Depression and the Second World War when they could not buy tires. Like this old farm woman who lived through the Great Depression and who forever after lived her life out of a scarcity mentality, afraid to enjoy or employ the most beautiful possessions she had for fear that she might possibly lose them or break them. Well, many of us, too, many of us, live our lives out of a similar scarcity. Living in scarcity mode may have nothing to do with how much money or assets I have, how rich I am, or how poor I might be. Living in a scarcity mode means living in fear. It means living in fear of losing what I have, in fear of giving too much of myself away, and someday perhaps not having enough. It's difficult for scarcity people to give their time or their energy or their loyalty to anyone else, even to people they say they love, even to causes they claim to believe in. Now compare this way of living with people who live in an abundance mode. People who live in abundance mode, they live in positive energy. They are aware of all they have, all the ways in which their lives are blessed. They have no fear of giving themselves to others or to good works and great causes because they know the one great secret of spiritual living, the one that Francis of Assisi spoke of when he said, it is in giving, it is in giving that we receive. Abundant people have their good china unpacked and on display because they've learned long ago that's what China is for. Now, in my own life, last spring, I decided not to just stay in the newly renovated basement, but to respond to the call that went out from the UUA asking retired ministers to come out of retirement and help with a shortage of interim ministers. I took the risk, and I unpacked my own teacups that is a way of saying I have been sharing and I will continue to share what wisdom I have learned as I serve as your minister in the last few months and in the coming months. How is it with your spirit these days? 
Are you living your life from a scarcity mode or an abundance mode? If your family were asked the question about you today, if your children or your best friends were asked the question, how would they respond? How would your children describe you? If your friends and fellow workers and neighbors were asked to describe you in these terms, what would they say about you? Would they call you a scarcity person or an abundance person? Our Unitarian Universalist faith, faith is about helping people to live more abundant lives, more generous lives, more giving lives. Our church isn't about teaching people to live more timidly, more fearfully, more guardedly in the world. Our faith calls each of us to take risks, not to just clean the basement, but to live and to love courageously in this world. These days, as we learn to live with COVID, this is what I hope for when I venture out to church on Sunday morning. I come here hoping that being with all of you will enrich my life and that I in turn in some way will enrich yours. We come to church hoping it will bring greater abundance to our lives, spiritual, emotional, intellectual, aesthetic, communal abundance. Our faith calls us to live our lives from a sense of abundance with a greater appreciation and a greater awareness and use all of the best that is in us, the good stuff inside each of us, the good China, if you will, our best talents, our deepest loves, our highest ideals, our hopes, our dreams. I want to end the sermon the way Reverend Patrick O'Neill ended his story about the teacups. Patrick said, So here, then, is a little spiritual exercise for you to try this week. And he said, You thought being a Unitarian Universalist meant never having to do spiritual exercises. But this takes courage. And it is not without risk. Some afternoon this week, or perhaps some early morning, when there's no one else around, go ahead and take down the nicest cup in your house and have yourself a cup of tea. Have it in memory of that old farm woman in Yakima, Washington, who you never met. And while you're doing that, give thanks. This gesture of abundance, it will change the way you live the rest of your week and maybe even the rest of your life. Now, a few words from our Fund Drive Committee. Janet and Jean. Hi everyone, I'm Janet Bowes and I serve on the executive team as the income steward. So thank you all for joining us on Celebration Sunday, a time to reignite and reconnect. This is the time of the year that the annual fund drive team asks members and friends of UDD, UDD, oh, if I can speak today, UUCDC, there, to make their pledge a financial commitment for the following fiscal year, which runs from July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2024. Your pledge helps UUCDC to thrive and to support the church's operating budget, such as salaries, utilities, uh, property maintenance, hospitality, social action projects, as well as towards the search of an interim and eventually a settled minister. So enclosed in your order of service is a pledge card. 
which if you are ready to complete, you can place in the box in the lobby. Those of you on Zoom or prefer to pledge online can go to the pledge button on the front page of the website. If you need more time to consider your pledge, you can make your pledge at home and either bring the card next week or go online. And if you have questions about the annual fund drive, please, please stop by our table in Fellowship Hall and a member of the Fund Drive team will be glad to answer those questions. We hope everyone will visit Fellowship Hall and celebrate with a cupcake and coffee. And if you're a visitor today, welcome. We do not expect you to make a pledge, but invite you um, and everyone to our celebration in Fellowship Hall and learn about UCDC's priorities for the year ahead and how all of our pledges collectively will help us achieve those goals. Thank you. And just as a side note, I use my china all the time. <laughs> Let's stand and join in singing our closing standing and join with me in our benediction as Joe extinguishes our child. For those who come here to see God, may God go with you. And for those, for those, those who come in raising life, may, may life return your affection. And for those who come to seek a path, may we be found to take the place This concludes